would go about solving this is I would say, hey, uh, we want a recommendation algorithm. Sounds like a, an RNN recurrent neural network, which is a lot of cruft and not easy to set up at all, and even more difficult to reason about how it works. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is, uh, sorry, this is Jay from Interview Query. Uh, today, I am joined by uh, Dan. He works as a engineer at Quizlet, uh, which is a uh, common like quiz, uh, quizzing company. Well, he can describe it better than I can, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't use it crazy amounts in school because I never studied. Um, but Dan, thanks for uh, doing this mock interview. Um, just up front, I'd love to just kind of get a quick uh, background on like how you got into engineering, uh, data, and tech. Yeah, uh, so my name's Dan. I am 26 and from Orange County. Uh, in high school, I was always uh, into math, but not coding at all. I shied away from it. Uh, my dad was a programmer, and uh, I don't know, I kind of wanted to branch out a little bit and try something new. Didn't yeah. really work out that way. Uh, then uh, I went to MIT, and I played a lot of League of Legends, and uh, decided I wanted a companion tool to... Uh, to determine what the optimal item to buy at a point in the game, like let's say you're winning, should you buy needlessly large rod or void staff? That was the question always in my mind. So uh, I did my first Python class, which enabled me to answer that question and uh, answer that question more in real time than you know doing it on paper and pencil. Uh, so then uh, from there, I uh, switched majors actually and switched to computer science uh, junior spring and hustle to finish. And then uh, I got my first job out of college uh, at Inflection, which is where I met Jay. Yes. Uh, and I was a data scientist there. Uh, but then actually shortly after that, I uh, went to Quizlet, where I still am today after just over four years. And uh, Quizlet, we do education technology and uh, classroom tools, uh, study tools and classroom games and stuff like that. And actually today we're announcing uh, uh, we just got a new Series C round of funding, and we were just valued wow. at a billion dollars. Wow, uh, so that's pretty Matt. sweet. <laughs> yeah, <Dang. laughs> that was just announced today. Pretty, uh, you know, coincidentally on the day of this mock interview. Uh, yeah, so uh, at Quizlet, I do uh, data engineering right now, but I'd say my tool set is pretty broad. Uh, I was recently database administrator at Quizlet, and uh, doing you know performance engineering and now is more compartmentalized uh data engineering as opposed to the sre work i used to do gotcha cool yeah um so yeah if you guys are interested in um potentially working at quizlet that's uh i'm sure they have some new capital to to invest over there <laughs> um yeah so i'd love to start this interview with uh a first question kind of um, and I think around like more data engineering system design, um, but uh, there is some more machine learning kind of aspect question to this. Uh, and so this is from Netflix, but um, let's say that you work as a machine learning engineer on Netflix. Um, how would you build like the recommendation engine for type ahead search? Uh, yeah, so I do have the advantage of having seen this question before, so I have a little uh, premeditation on it, but uh, here I go with uh, my response anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first, like right off the bat, the first way I would go about solving this is I would say, hey, uh, we want a recommendation algorithm. Sounds like a, an RNN recurrent neural network, which is a lot of cruft and not easy to set up at all, mm -hmm. and even more difficult to reason about how it works. Um, but now that I'm uh, a little more experienced, I definitely see the benefit of a much simpler model uh, with, you know, the benefit is that it's simpler. And uh, I propose that we can get similar results to a, a big corrupty uh, recurrent neural network uh, with a simple prefix matching. Uh, and we can certainly go into, you know, a lot of... Uh, sophistication with a simple prefix matching algorithm, it can be expanded upon and expanding on until we have uh, something that will be on par with an RNN. Uh, so working at Quizlet, uh, we actually have something similar to that. We have, we, at Quizlet, we have uh, kind of a flashcards model for most of our, uh, most of our service. Yep. And when a user is creating a flashcard, it's similar to the Netflix type ahead search. Uh, we, they will type in H-E-L-L, -L, H-E-L-O, and then it will auto-suggest hola if you're doing a Spanish translation set. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have that similar problem, and 
before I saw how we solved it, I would imagine the same way. Hey, we should do a recurrent neural network. That's not easy, but quite powerful. Um, but actually, we solved it using a prefix matching algorithm just to say, hey, look up in this database table, what does H-E-L-L-O prefix to and it uh, suffixes to the model H-O-L-A because most people are typing that. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, I'm not going to be actually coding this out. I'm just going to be talking about uh, the approach I would have. Yep. But uh, mm -hmm. so we could start with a simple thing. Hey, no matter who you are, what context you're in, we're just going to have a prefix table. Uh, and our prefix table starts with a uh, an input string, and that is your prefix, and it will output, uh, let's say one at a time to start with, uh, your output string. And I think scoping is very important. So for this minimum viable product, our MVP, we're gonna start with, hey, you input a string, and you're, you're gonna output your uh, suggestion string. Gotcha. And already, uh, already I'm thinking of things like, you know, fuzzy matching and context matching, like, hey, what if you are in a different language? Uh, but, you know, we're going to start off just scoping it. Uh, so how do we build such a thing uh, to do the simple prefix matching? Well, what we can do is uh, at Quizlet, we have the advantage of a huge corpus of data. Uh, so we have, you know, billions of terms that say, hey, when a user types hello, they usually want to output hola. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and actually translate this to the Netflix algorithm we're trying to solve. So yeah. if you're trying to, uh, I'm not so familiar with what's on Netflix, but if you're trying to input uh, the big, uh, that could output any number of uh, suffixes. If that's your prefix, you yeah. could output the big short or the big Lebowski, two movies I'm a fan of. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so how is your model going to do this? Well, what you can do is you can say, well, in our existing search corpus of billions of searches, what proportion of the time do people typing in the big actually click on the big Lebowski and what proportion of time do they output uh, the big short? Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you could just have a simple thing that has every match, every possible uh, search prefix that has ever been typed on Netflix, output that to the most common uh, most common thing that they clicked on and boom, that's your prefix matching a uh, recommendation algorithm for type ahead search. So I'll cut in right there. Um, yeah. So isn't that uh, actually prone to bias though? So that's based off of an existing algorithm though, right? Because um, that mm -hmm. would then have to mean that uh, when you typed in the big, there was some like existing Netflix recommender that had to put the big short or the big Lebowski, like one of them in front of the other. So that would have um, given mm -hmm. like some sort of like bias towards like the first one, which could have been the big short or the big Lebowski. So is Absolutely. there a way that we then can, um, you know, counteract that because then it's, we could be feeding ourselves into like some weird loop, right. Of like just mm -hmm. optimizing against, um, bad data. Right. Because if, uh, Netflix in, in the initial case, Netflix didn't even recommend, uh, what's another big movie. I don't know. Like big the big like just big by sure tom hanks. yeah tom hanks <laughs> uh so if we didn't even rec recommend that in the old case then we're gonna have very few hits where um where the user typed in big and it outputs you know the tom hanks movie yep. so a solution to that might be hey ignore whatever netflix recommends and only use the corpus of what the user types so just free form text we go from hey, you typed the big, and then you finish typing the big short, regardless of any Netflix interaction. Okay. And you know, that's hard to do because there's yep. you know, an existing state yep. of Netflix type ahead. But I, th I think it's a good, happy medium. Um, and one thing you could do is do your best to account for that bias and say, hey, 10% of the time, the user clicked on the Tom Hanks movie, even though 0% of the time in the existing case did we recommend that. So you, it seems like you can Bayesian update that with to say, hey, even though it wasn't recommended, the user really wanted to follow that. So that should be a lot more valuable in a potential type ahead search algorithm. Uh, the thing I want to dive into more is uh, context yeah. matching. Uh, so you could context match based on the user, say, hey, if you're suggesting the big Lebowski and the user happens to, or if you're typing in the big and the user you know is a big fan of uh, Coen Brothers movies, then you're gonna boost Lebowski a lot higher than it would be otherwise. Yep. Well, how do you do that if your model, let's say we're gonna be constrained to a model is input output, string, uh, string input, string output, 
but uh, let's say now you can also provide, you have a string input and a user profile with a various number of features yep. uh, into now a string output. So now what I'm imagining is you can convert this user profile into a, a k-means clustered node. So now we say, okay, we have user profile has a bunch of features. We can output this into either Coen Brothers fan, not Coen Brothers fan. Okay. So if you're a Coen Brothers fan and you type the big, every time we're gonna recommend um, the Big Lebowski. And if you're not a Coen Brothers fan, every time we're, we're going to recommend the Big Short, for example, or something else. Okay, so if we're looking at that too, won't that create um, a super sparse uh, data set for us? Uh, because you can imagine like you have a user profile and it says uh, likes Coen Brothers, right? But this could be mm -hmm. like every director or writer actor alive, right? Be like likes Ryan Gosling or not, or likes Tom yeah. you know, Hanks or not. Um, so uh, that would probably provide like um, literally like maybe thousands, uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of features, right? To our um, yeah. community. Uh, is there a way that we can, uh, what would that do to our data set? And like, what could we do to make sure that doesn't um, influence like the end recommendation algorithm? So I think to uh, to better containerize this, we can we we uh, we know that the existing Netflix user profile has thousands of features. But yep. what we can do is we can have kind of middleware to say, hey, for this stage, for this version of our type ahead algorithm, we only uh, we will have a converter of this is the user profile and this is the output feature set, and that output feature set is going to be a lot more sparse. Exactly. So as we, as we initialize for our first product, that feature set will be zero features. But uh, as we expand, we can say, hey, now this feature set is one feature, yes or no. Do you like Cohen Brothers? We'll continue on that path. Uh, so uh, using that, we can, in tandem, change our model to say, hey, this is how many features it accepts, and this is how many features it converts this large user profile into a new a new output user profile specifically for this case uh, mm -hmm. that has this the matching number of features uh, so we keep dimensionality the same and we can grow it at at a similar pace gotcha cool um so i guess lastly um what do we have to think about in terms of scale for this uh algorithm, yeah. right uh, because we can assume that probably like I don't even know, like millions of people are using Netflix per day. Um, and mm -hmm. so at that point, um, how do we have to think about like the engineering that goes into the implementation of this uh, algorithm? Yeah. So I'm imagining several layers on top of this and each one of those layers, if it breaks, could, if it, you know, gets outscaled by, uh, by user activity, uh, could bring down the entire system. Uh, so the first is the, uh, is the thing that measures okay, we have a user, what is their profile? Let's map it to a feature set that is the right dimensionality, okay? Uh, that has to be able to scale up, but hey, with the new, <laughs> the new bright future of Kubernetes, that should be quite doable. And what's nice is uh, it should, it's a static, uh, a pure static function to convert a user profile, which we can fetch. And I would hope Netflix has scaled that fetch a user profile based on a user ID. Yes. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that falling over. Uh, the next thing, now that we have a user profile, uh, grab a lookup key based on the user profile. That's also a pure function, not too difficult. Right. But now, uh, now we have now we have a user profile, so we can uh, we can point that at a specific model, and we have what the user already input. Uh, putting fuzzy matching aside, uh, let's say, how do I map this string to an output? Uh, I don't think it scales very well to have a lookup table based on uh, whatever input string they had onto an output variable because there's a lot of uh, a lot of redundancy on that. Yep. Uh, so uh, the da the uh, the data structure I've mapped this onto maybe it's the best maybe it's not but it's the first one that comes to my mind anyway. It's called a I don't know if it's pronounced try perhaps T R I E. Uh, yeah. So that is perfect for this prefix matching problem. So this says if you're typing uh, big, it doesn't have a key at the top layer of B-I-G. Instead, it has each letter of the alphabet. So B points to a subtry, and I, in that is going to be your second key of that subtry, points to another subtry, and then G points to a third one, and it's, um, uh, it's uh, recursive. 
Uh, so now once we reach that third try node, G, that will map to what we suggest. So it is a very deep try, but hopefully it keeps uh, things hot in the cache. So if you typed big space L, we already have the advantage of the cache being warm to fetch B-I-G. And now that L is one more letter and should hopefully point to the exact thing we're trying to find. Gotcha. So does that mean that this kind of try would have it so that for each um, word and then a space, uh, we'd have big and then like the entire uh, 26 letters of then um, the next kind of, of cached variables, right? Mm -hmm. So big A, could be like apple i don't know big b baby <laughs> something like that and then all those tries down the, down the list exactly exactly and if if uh so it, it can, that could also take care of fuzzy matching depending how you build that if you build that try so if you type the b k g uh then it, you could say oh it's fat finger k instead of i and then your try perhaps could be knowledgeable about that mm, gotcha. um, cool so stuff like that uh, awesome. And then uh, in terms of serving this uh, in real time, is there anything that we have to think about in terms of uh, how like the caching then works in terms of uh, returning the results of the movies? Uh, because mm -hmm. then it seems like we have to then return um, uh, a lot of results based on the user entity plus the uh, actual um, input. And so I'm imagining that uh, distributing this across uh, multiple, like the entire world uh, requires some more like performance, like considerations, right? And like, what are sure. the considerations we have to make? Um, so uh, one thing that comes to mind as we're you know, serving this live system that has to be always up is deployment. Um, but hopefully at all our levels of deployment, we could have uh, the version number be a cache key. So we'll never have, any overlap there returning scale results. Okay. Um, as far as scaling across all our users across the globe, uh, um, our, that layer of converting a user profile to a condensed feature set will hopefully um, reduce the cache size or, mm -hmm. or reduce the cache domain. So now, yes, we are caching on input string and this uh, condensed user profile, but we can grow that uh, incrementally to say, hey, on, in on initialization, there are no user profiles. There's just a one size fits all. And then as we grow, we can say, okay, now there's two, now there's a thousand. And, or now there's two, now there's three, now there's 10, now there's a thousand. So we can hopefully grow those and see at what point which things start to break. Oh, is our cache system falling over? Do we need to have a tighter, tighter grasp around that to make sure that doesn't fall over? Uh, but if we grow slowly, I'm imagining on initialization, one user profile, you know, cached on yes, every input string is not going to fall over because the dimensionality is so low. And you could limit on like the first 10 characters and that should fetch you, uh, that should give you a good signal on what <laughs> move you're trying to get after 10 characters. And yeah, 26 to the 10 is pretty big, but at least, at least recently used cache is going to be, you know, pretty performant on real user input. Great. Awesome.